In this video, I am going to demonstrate how you can design and build a portable speaker box much like this one I have here. It has the capacity for 50 watts per channel and is designed to be a very efficient and reliable portable speaker that has capabilities to be upgraded in the future. So let's see how it's built. To start, I needed to choose an amplifier as it is the heart of this project. Oftentimes with portable devices like this, a class D amplifier is used. But before we use one, let's take a look into how one of these amplifiers works. These amplifiers work in a way that is very different to that of a typical class A, B, or AB amplifier. Those amplifiers work through amplification of an analog signal through a transistor or a transistor network. They have low distortion but high losses, being only about 60% efficient at best and 20% at worst. Class D amplifiers work by using pulse width modulation on a high frequency square wave in order to amplify. The amplitude of the input signal is represented by changing lengths of the high and low values on this square wave. The square wave is then amplified by a pair of MOSFETs, which act as switches and switch on and off completely, mirroring the PWM modulated square wave on the output. This is where the amplification happens, and because the transistors are either on or off, very little power is lost in the transistors. Unlike class A and B amplifiers, these amplifiers have a theoretical efficiency of 100%. This is not attainable, obviously, but it isn't uncommon to have an amp like this be 90 to 95% efficient. In order to make an analog signal out of this high power square wave that's created, the wave is passed through a low pass filter to remove the high frequency carrier wave, and the now analog signal is passed through a high pass filter to remove any DC offset that might occur. And that's the secret to how these amplifiers get such high efficiencies. These amps are good to use for a project like this because they are relatively cheap, small, efficient, and reliable. Thermal conditions are almost a non-issue due to their high efficiency. For COTS sake, the amplifier board that I chose is based off of the TDA7492, a chip manufactured by ST Microelectronics which has capabilities of 50 watts of power per channel. As always, it's a good idea to look at the datasheet for the chip you plan on using because it can give you valuable information for your specific application. For example, I'm using 4 ohm speakers, and this amp was actually designed primarily for 8 ohm speakers. It still works with 4 ohm loads, but I need to be more careful with the input voltage, and I only get about 45 watts out per channel. In my case, this is fine, but whenever you're designing something like this, make sure to take a good look at the datasheet. This board costs $16.50, and it's hard to find a better value out there. While the amplifier is the main component for the speaker box, the speakers are the next obvious choice. I chose these coaxial car speakers by Pioneer because they fit my size budget, had good reviews, and decent looks. Speaker choice is a very case-by-case -case basis, and your choice may vary depending on what you want. You may go with a component speaker system with separate woofers, tweeters, and all that crossover stuff, or you may want to go with something compact and simple, like what I chose. They're simple to install and have pretty decent sound quality, well, according to the reviews. There are many cheaper options out there that may be just as good, maybe salvaged even, but I figured that this box would last me a long time, so the $30 price difference between these Pioneer speakers and these Pile speakers isn't very much of an issue when looking at the long term. Only the smaller components are needed now, like the potentiometer, 3.5mm jack switches, and external connectors. When designing a stereo speaker box like this, make sure you get a potentiometer with two sections like this one, one for each channel. Also, because I'm making a sealed box, I tried to make sure to get a nice sealed 3.5mm jack. As for the switches and connectors, I had quite a few things lying around to use and salvage from. The external speaker hookups were from an old home stereo I found, and the switches and battery charge connectors were from general salvage I had lying around. These components can be purchased easily through DigiKey or similar websites, but salvaging is always a good option because it's free. Just make sure the switches are panel mount and the right size. Now that the electronics are roughly designed, we can get started on the cabinet itself. This probably has nearly the largest impact on the sound quality, second only to the speakers in the case. There are many complicated equations and designs that you could try, but for simplicity's sake, I went with a simple sealed enclosure. There are calculations that could have been done in order to get the perfect enclosure, but I just eyeballed the volume. A ported box would have provided louder bass and maybe overall better sound quality, but the risks of messing up outweigh the benefits. Unlike a vented or ported box, messing up a sealed enclosure doesn't mess up the audio quality all that much. You don't need to be as precise. Just make sure your enclosure is big enough for if you're going sealed. You can make a sealed box any way you want to, but I decided to make it so that nearly no end grain was shown, mainly just for looks. 
I did this by cutting 45 degree angles in all the edges of the pieces so that way they would all fit together without the end grain showing very much. While this makes it a huge pain to put together, the looks are a great touch. Two 5 inch diameter speaker holes were cut onto either side of the front and a rectangular hole was cut for the control panel. In this case, I'm planning to mount the control panel inside the box so that the controls are recessed and not accidentally pressed. When making an enclosure like this with electronics inside, make sure you have a plan of how you're going to put all the electronics and batteries inside. I won't be able to solder together all the circuitry once it's together, so I planned on having all the electronics, except for the battery, on the top piece that I would then glue on. Now that I had a plan, the front, back, and sides were glued together with a band clamp, which was just a nylon strap that was tightened around the four pieces. When making a speaker enclosure, or really any project where glue is the primary bonding agent, make sure to use a lot of it. It'll also seal the enclosure nicely if it covers all the edges, which it should. After those four pieces were assembled, the bottom was glued on, and I did this by gluing on the piece after I marked where the battery would go. I just set a few heavy weights on it to hold it in place. It fit nicely, and now that five of the six sides are on, it's time to assemble the electronics on the top panel, as it will be nearly impossible to access anything inside the box after everything is glued. The only access points I would have would be the two 5-inch holes in the front. So here's the diagram for how the front panel looks, and I decided to go the extra mile and laser etch some designs and labels into the piece so I could know what all the switches do. This was fairly easy. All I did was put a thin but complete coat of black metal paint onto a scrap piece of stainless steel I cut. It was off to the laser etcher next, and after a few passes it looked pretty good. In order to protect the paint, a few coats of glossy clear coat were added. The glossy finish makes the blacks darker, and also makes the silver pop out a lot more. The holes for the circular components in the panel were cut by using a hole punch, and the larger holes, along with the rectangular ones, were cut with a nibbler, which gave the rectangular edges a very clean look. So now the all-important control panel is pretty much done. The way the electronics will be wired is represented in this diagram, and as you can see, it's rather messy. You can pause the video now if you want to copy down this diagram, and you can also follow the wires and see how all the switches work, but I'll just move on, because this diagram is pretty specific to my box. As you can see by the physical wiring here, this can get messy very fast. Keep track of all your wires, try to color code things if you can, so that you can keep everything in order. Make sure to give your circuit a quick test before you glue on the piece of wood though, because you won't be able to fix anything once it's together. One circuit I want to show off a little bit is this low voltage indicator I found. The goal of this circuit is to light an LED when the battery voltage falls below 10.5 volts, which is as low as you want to go when dealing with lead acid batteries like this. Ideally, I would have used a comparator, but I couldn't find any, so an op amp had to do. It essentially acts as a comparator in this case, and it compares a voltage from the battery to a reference that is set up by a Zener diode. Again, there are weird component values in this circuit because I was dealing with salvage again, but as always, experiment with things until something works. Like, I think the Zener diode was of a very weird voltage, so I just had to sort of trial and error it until it was about 10.5 volts. As for mounting the pre-assembled boards, hot glue will be enough, so long as you use a lot of it. Make sure to apply a decent amount of pressure when you're doing this, but these boards should stay in place in normal scenarios as they're pretty light. The top panel was then glued on, and then the box was sanded a lot. Most of the sanding was to just get the sides lined up and be flush with each other, mainly because the 45 degree angle cuts that I used can cause gaps and overlaps. Use wood filler if you need to fill some larger gaps. I also used a sander to round the edges of the box as well because I didn't have a router on hand. And heavy grit sandpaper on a vibratory sander like I have can do a pretty good job of making nice rounds. After all that, ebony stain was applied, and I would actually recommend against using this stain on maple, mainly because it's so hard to get the maple to absorb it, and the color that could come through from the maple doesn't blend all that well with ebony. I probably, if I would have gone with a dark color, chosen like gunstock or even just no stain at all because if you want the grain to show, don't really want to put anything over it other than just a clear coat of polyurethane. For the finish, I just used a glossy clear coat so that the blacks would look a little bit better, but the spray from the can caused some weird patterns to occur and a little bit of dripping. So one thing I would recommend when finishing projects like this is to take your time, because finishing is what makes a project look good or rushed, so you want to make sure it looks good. So it's pretty much done now. Mounting the speakers was easy enough, and after it was all together, it sounded okay. I tried adding some filler material to like increase the volume, not sound level, but like um, in the speaker sense, they adding material inside sort of makes the box seem bigger to the speakers, which 
can add more bass, make it sound a little better, but it didn't seem to do all that much with the sound quality with my particular setup. Overall, in the final product, the bass response seemed a little bit low, but that was almost entirely due to the poor low end of the speakers I bought, and probably not the cabinet. Like, so I could always swap these speakers out for something better if I want to. And I would take a guess and say that the battery life of this thing is probably about, like, anywhere between 8 and 12 hours at full volume because of the super high efficiency amplifier. The electronics driving it are definitely sound, so... With that, I can just put in like a component system in the future with like a dedicated woofer and a tweeter, a little simple crossover, make it sound really good. And I can keep all the same electronics in there because I made sure to build them right. So yeah, this is how to make one of these speaker boxes, sort of design considerations if you are thinking of making one. And yeah, thank you for watching. I'll see you again next time.